everybody, and welcome to Church Online. We are so excited that you tuned in today because God has something so special for you. Please like and share this message because it could be the very thing, the very word that God has to transform your life and someone else's. So prepare your hearts for what God has today. For the word this morning. Are you ready for the word this morning? Amen, amen. Uh, and so this morning, I'm going to be teaching on the subject, It's Your Turn. Um, it's your turn. And now, one thing that you need to know about me is I love God, I love my wife, I love my children, I love my family, and then I love sports. <laughs> like it's, and, and unfortunately, um, the Georgia Bulldogs are pretty much high up there. Uh, I told my wife on the way here, I said, I need to get there early so I can get to the altar to repent because of how the game went last night. Um, I just need to get my mind right, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but I'm still believing for a national championship. We didn't get the SEC championship. That's all right. Uh, I'm still believing for the national championship. Um, but so what, I'm saying that to, all, to say this. Um, a lot of things, whenever I'm, I'm preaching the word of God, God really kind of pulls things out in a sports metaphor for me. Um, I think, I think if, if, if you know, I mean, God, when God's speaking to you, a lot of times he's going to speak to you in a way that you understand. Uh, he's going to speak to you in ways that you can connect. Um, and, and so for me, a lot of times when God speaks to me, it's sports metaphors or family metaphors. Um, because for me, um, that's kind of my life. I love sports. My kids play sports. My son is in middle school, plays football and baseball for the middle school. Um, and so sports has always been my life. It's now his life. Um, and so when God speaks to me, it has, it's either something to do with marriage, my children, and, and a reference to them, or sports. And so this morning, as I speak about uh, It's Your Turn, I begin to think about Michael Jordan. How many of you know who Michael Jordan is? I know he's not really that popular of a guy, probably never heard of him. Um, so let me tell you who he is. Um, some would call him the GOAT. Um, if you know what that means, great. If not, let me just tell you, GOAT means greatest of all time. So if you're on uh, some of you are like, oh, that's what that means. Okay. So if you're on Facebook and you, say, you see someone say, oh, he's the GOAT or they're the GOAT, uh, what that means is that uh, they believe that that person is the greatest of all time. Now, I, I can't argue with that, but on the flip side of that, I'm a huge Lakers fan and I was a huge Kobe Bryant fan. And you know, the, the, the parallels between them two, if people want to... Uh, argue who's better, Michael or Kobe. I think it was two different eras. I think there was two different levels of competition, two different levels of uh, athletes. So I don't really think it's a relevant, um, a relevant uh, argument. To me, I believe they were, both of them are probably two of the greatest of all times. Um, but when I think about Michael Jordan, the thing that sticks out to me about his story is he loved basketball, played basketball. Um, but you may not know this, but he did not make his high school team he didn't make his high school basketball team until his junior year of high school. Now, you think one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Man, he probably was playing middle school basketball, probably started as a freshman, and just dominated. No, that's not what happened. Michael Jordan did not even make his high school basketball team until his junior year. So what did Michael Jordan do? I watched a documentary about him and the, 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 the 90 Bulls that just took an incredible run, six championships and all that, and I watched that. And he was talking about how whenever it came to him not even making his high school team until his junior year, he said, I knew I was better than a lot of those guys, he said, but I didn't make the team. He said, so you know what I did? I didn't pout about it. I didn't cry about it. I didn't get upset about it. I went back to the gym. I worked harder. I shot more. I dribbled more. I ran more. I got myself in shape more because I knew eventually my time would come. And so Michael Jordan didn't pout and whine that he didn't make his high school team. He said, you know what, I'm going to take this as a moment to better myself so when my time does come, I can excel and show who I really am. And what I believe is this. I don't believe it's luck because what I believe is that um, I believe that success happens. And Michael Jordan's success happened. I believe success happens is when preparation meets opportunity. And see, Michael Jordan's opportunity came, and because of his preparation, now we call him the GOAT. And I believe that your time is coming. I believe that this morning you're going to understand that it's your turn. Michael Jordan, when it became his turn, he took full advantage of his turn. He took full advantage of the moment. And because of that, we consider him one of the greatest of all times. And I believe this morning that 
when you look back over this word and you look back over this Sunday morning, I'm believing and I'm praying that this will be a stepping stone for you to understand that it is your turn. Whether you are six years old, 16 years old, 56 years old, or 78 years old, however old you are, I don't care. I believe that God is still wanting to do something in your life today. Amen? Amen. So in 1 Samuel 16, 1 Samuel 16, um, I gave them the scripture. I don't know if they put it on the screen. If not, get out your Bible. If you have a real Bible, awesome. If not, pull out your phone and uh, pull out, uh, go to your Bible app. I'm going to give you just a second because I want you to follow along with me this morning. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Ooh. Y'all like each other? Yeah, come on now. Y'all are like, neighbor. Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. It's your turn. Say, neighbor, neighbor. it's my turn. My turn. Amen. Amen. In 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13, when you're there, say there. there. All right, that's what I'm talking about. And in verse 16, it said, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as a king over Israel? Fill your horn, horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about me, he, kill, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. And when he arrived in Bethlehem, the elders of the town uh, trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons, invited them to come to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Aren't you glad this morning that the Lord doesn't look at our outward appearance? But aren't you glad that he looks at our heart? Aren't you, aren't you glad that the Lord don't look at our stupid mistakes we make and the stupid things that we say and the things we think we can do our own? But aren't you glad that the Lord looks at our hearts? Then in verse 8 it says, Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen any of these. So he asked Jesse, are, are these all of your sons? And then Jesse replies, there is still the youngest. He is tending the sheep. And Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and he brought him in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. And what I love about this is that Samuel was going through this process. He, was tell, he said, Jesse, he said, show me your son, show him to me. And what you need to understand is Jesse's sons, they were big strapping men. They were big old dudes. They were his pride and joy. They were the ones that Jesse was proud of, right? And so whenever, whenever uh, Samuel came and said, hey, Jesse, show me your sons, Jesse picked his best to bring before the anointed one, right? To bring before Samuel. He chose the best. He said, here's this son and this son and this son. And every single time Samuel was like, oh, this is the one. Oh, this ain't it. Oh, it must be this big old guy. Oh, it's not him. It must be this strong. Oh, it's not him either. And he went through seven of them and it was not him. None of them guys that he lined up in front of, the ones that we thought, the ones that he thought, the ones that to the natural eye says, these have to be the ones, was not the one. And then Samuel was like, well, then if these aren't the guys and I'm supposed to be anointing your son king, then surely there must be another one somewhere, right? Surely there's got to be someone that you're not showing me. And so Samuel was like, yo, Jesse, hey, let me ask you a question, man. Um, I see your prized possession up here. I see the seven sons that you think are the best of the best. Um, but man, God, God's not really saying these are the ones. Like, do you have another son? Is there something you're not telling me? Like, are you hiding somebody? What's going on? And all of a sudden, Jesse's like, 
<sighs> yeah, I mean, you got the old runt out there, the one that nobody likes, the one that I put out to the field so I ain't got to look at and deal with, the one that kind of tends my flock so I can just kind of keep him busy. You know, you got old David out there. You got him. And Jesse was like, you know, Jesse was, you know, he was like, you know, this is this son. I've got him right here. Here he is, you know, whatever. And Samuel was like, oh, so you have another son. He's like, well, then bring him in. Let me see. Him. Well, then in, in Samuel's mind, I, be, in Samuel's mind I, be, I, be, I believe it begins to click with him that, OK, here's the seven best. Here's one that's out there. This is probably going to be the one. Because how many of you know, again, that God ain't looking at the outward appearance. God is looking at the heart. Right. And so here David is out just tending the sheep, tending the sheep of his father, doing his job doing what he is supposed to be doing in this season of his life, right? And so here he is, he's out there, and, and, and Samuel says, hey, I tell you what, go get that boy. Go get David, bring him in, and I tell you what, we're not going to sit down till he comes in the house. We're not going to sit down, we're not going to move, we're going to stay standing until he walks in. And in this moment, I don't know if you understand this or not, but back then, whenever a king showed up in the room, what happened? You stood up. And so Samuel's already putting two and two together, like, hey, we ain't going to sit down until he walks in, because when he walks in, we're going to be standing up, because we're going to honor the king that is to come, right? And so he goes and gets David, and David comes in, right? And so I want you to think, as I was reading this, there was a few things that really stuck out to me. First is this, God selects what man rejects. Yes. Hear me. Yes. God selects what man rejects. See, man chose these seven guys right here. The seven brothers, the seven sons, the pride and joy, the best of the best. Jesse thought that these seven had to be the one. So this is what Jesse chose. But God selected the one that was out in the field by himself, tending his father's sheep, being obedient in this season, doing what he was supposed to be doing, doing what his father asked him to be doing in this season. Right? And so I want you to understand today, as I look back over my life, I should not have been selected. I made some mistakes, y'all. I've done some things I ain't proud of. Oh, it's just me this morning. It's just me this morning. Well, I guess I'm going to preach to myself today. I've done some things I ain't proud of. I've done some things, and I look back over my life, I say, thank God you protected me. Thank God for your grace. Thank God for your mercy. Because when people look at my past, they say, there's no way that guy should be up there doing what he's doing. But again, I'm so glad that though man may reject what they see, God selects what he can use for his glory. God selects a willing vessel for his glory. Amen? Another thing that came out was this, as I was reading this. If I was David and I walked into the room and I realized that I was kind of last choice, I realized kind of what had already taken place in front of me. I realized that my father picked these seven guys and not me, my seven brothers and not me. I would have walked in that room a little disappointed. I would have walked in there and be like, yo, what's, what, what's going on in here? Like, what, what's happening? Oh, well, um, Samuel came to anoint a king. Oh, he did? Okay, so um, why are my seven brothers standing right here? And I've been out there. What, what's going on? And it was in that moment I thought, you know, you can't, hear me, you can't disappoint what God appoints. It would be easy to be disappointed. True? You could, how many of you know, you, how many of you have ever walked into a room and knowing that you was a topic of conversation? Huh? You walked in, everybody's talking, you walk into the room, it's like, Phew! and you're like, well, what's, what's happening in here? Okay, apparently y'all was talking about me, praise the Lord. Hope it was good. If not, hey, it's all right. But it would have been easy. Think about Michael Jordan. It would have been easy to be disappointed when he wasn't selected. In the same way, it would have been easy for David to be disappointed knowing that he wasn't an original selection of his father's. Man, what a disappointment. What an, how, I mean, I would be upset to know that my father didn't even think enough of me to bring me into the house whenever this man of God has showed up to appoint a king. I would have been disappointed. But David just comes in there and like, hey, guys, what's up? How y'all doing? I've been out here, for, you know, hanging out with the sheep. What y'all need? We good? Everybody all right? Okay. How y'all doing? You know, Sammy, how you doing? You know, he walks in. I'm telling you, he walks in and he's cool. Cool as a cucumber, right? And so you cannot be disappointed when you're not selected because, again, you can't disappoint what God appoints. See, you don't have to position yourself. When I look at David, you don't have to position yourself to be selected. 
Listen, I've been in a place in my life, man, that I have tried to work myself into something. I've tried to work myself into a position. I tried to smooth talk myself into something. You ever been there? You ever feel like, man, if I could just work a little harder than that person, I'll get the promotion. And on my job, man, if I could just work a little bit harder and do a little bit more and suck up to the boss a little bit more, I'm going to be the one to get that promotion. But what I found out is this. Whenever God has a calling and a purpose on your life, you do not have to position or work yourself into being called. All you have to do is be, uh, to, to, is to be good in the season that you're in right now. Be confident in the season you're in right now. Be obedient in the season you're in right now. Here David is, man. He's out there in the field, and he wasn't even in the lineup. He's out there in the field, tending the flock, watching after the sheep. He's out there being faithful in his season doing what his father has asked him to do. He wasn't in there like, oh, there's a king. Somebody's coming to anoint the king. Let me run in here and just, hey, hey, you see me? Here I am. Hey, hey, I know. Oh, hey, you see me? Nah, he had no clue. He wasn't trying to position himself. He wasn't trying to work himself into something great. He was being obedient in the season that he was in. Now, I need you all to follow me. I know I'm trying to develop something. Y'all just stay with me for a minute. All right. So, he did not have to position himself to be used by God. I want to encourage you this morning. Keep watching after the kids. Keep cleaning the toilets. Keep vacuuming the sanctuary. Keep serving on the parking team. Keep doing those things that you're doing in this season. Can I tell you why? Because there will come a time whenever God sees your faithfulness in the season you're serving in right now. There will come a time that God sees your faithfulness and says, I can use that obedience I can use that faithfulness, and he will promote you to something even greater. Be faithful in the season you're in. Can I say it this way? Continue to tend your father's sheep. Continue to look after the sheep that your father has entrusted to you. Amen? So even though David wasn't appointed, he went back to the field. Even when he was appointed king, he went back to the field. I don't know if you know this or not. So he comes in. Samuel said, hey, this is the one. Anoints him king. And guess what David does? David says, all right, hey, thank y'all, brothers. Love you. Dad, appreciate you selecting me, man. We good, all right? And uh, I'm going to go back to the field and continue with serving in the season that I'm serving in, continuing to do what you've asked me to do. Because it would have been real easy in that moment to be like, yo, Dad, you didn't select me. You just saw me anoint a king. You go look after your own sheep. I'm going to sit right here, put my feet up, bring me some food. You know what I'm saying? It would have been real easy for that. Matter of fact, I think most of us probably would have been like that. I'd be like, hey, brothers, ha, got them. You know what I'm saying? But like, y'all thought y'all was the ones. Hear me, little runt, even though I'm a little handsome, because it said it. He was the handsome one. So what that tells me is seven brothers was ugly. They was probably big, but they was ugly. You know what I'm saying? But the small little handsome boy was the one selected. And it would have been easy for him to be like, yo, I'm king. I ain't doing this no more. I'm not going to be obedient to my father in the, anymore. I'm king now. Y'all serve me. No, no, no. David said, hey, man, I'm anointed king. Okay, are we good here? Everybody good? I got some sheep I got to go look after. I got to go make sure they're protected. I got to go make sure the lions and the bears aren't attacking them. I've got to go out here and make sure my father's business is still being tended to. Come on, somebody. Right? And so, at, so even though he was already appointed king, he went out and continued to serve in the season he was in. So let's see how David enters into his next season. In 1 Samuel 17, 17 through 19, we all know this story. And I know you've probably heard it preached a thousand times, but guess what? You're going to hear it a thousand and one this morning. And so in verse 17, it says, Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah and roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along with these, th these things, ten cheese, take along these ten cheeses to the commander of the unit. See how your brothers are. Bring back some assurance from them. They are, if, uh, they are with Saul and all of the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines, right? So what I love about this is David goes back, continues to serve, continues to be obedient in his season, continues to watch after his, his father's sheep, and, he, and his dad calls him in. He was anointed, goes back, out to the, goes back out to the field, and his dad says, hey, come back out to the field. I need you to run an errand for me, right? And so David was sent on an errand to run 
to go check on his brothers, right? So his, his dad said, hey, go check on your brothers. Take them this cheese, take them this stuff, but go check on them. When you get there, make sure they're okay because, you know, me and your mama, we're a little worried about them. Go make sure they're okay and then come back and let us know they're good because we just want to make sure they're good because they're going against the battle. They, they, you, know, you know the story, right? So they're, they're, a little, they're a little worried. Mom's a little worried. Go get the, get the good news. Let them know we're good and come back, all right? So he went. So as I was reading this, I, I began to think, now, why would his dad send him out whenever he's got, already got a job, already tending after the sheep? Why would his dad send him out there? And as I took a step back, I, said, I thought about this, that this had to be a test for his promotion. Because once again, he could have said, Dad, I ain't going out of that battlefield. I've been anointed king. I'm going to hang out right here with the sheep until my time comes. I don't care what you want me to do. Dad, go send somebody else. Send one of your servants. Send somebody else because I'm going to hang out. But no, what did David do? David said, though I've been anointed king and I'm continuing to be faithful in this season, Dad, if this is what you're asking me to do, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go. I'm going to go out into the field. I'm going to go to the battlefield. I'm going to go check on my brothers. I'm going to make sure they're okay. I'm going to take them this cheese that you sent me to take. I'm going to make sure they're good. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to let you know how they are. Right? That's what he did. But it was a test of promotion because we know where the story's going, right? We know where the story's going. So will you, let me ask you this this morning. Will you do the little things in your life? Will you do the little things that God is asking you to do? Will you do the little things that seem beneath you? Come on, somebody. When I started in youth ministry, and I knew, I knew at 12 years old I had a calling on my life, I ran from it. I wanted the perfect little uh, American family. I wanted the wife, the two kids, the house with the picket fence, dog in the front yard. That's what I wanted. Right? That was my thing. I was like, man, if I can just achieve that, I'm going to be good. I want to have, you know, that's what I want, right? And so as I was working towards that, you know, I, I, I realized very quickly, um, again, like I said, at 12 years old, I had a calling on my life. And I was, I was working towards this life that I thought I wanted for me. It was very apparent that that was not the life for me. I was not called to be an engineer, which, ever, which I was already going to school for, already had an associate's in computer drafting. I was working at an engineering firm while going to college, doing all of this stuff. That's what I was working towards. I'd met this young lady over here. I was like, man, I'm going to be an engineer. She's gonna, I'm going to marry her. We're going to have kids. We're gonna, man, it's going to be a great life, right? And so I'm working towards these plans I had for myself, trying to make a life for myself. But at 12 years old, I knew I had a calling on my life. And after just being around her for a little while, and her dad's a pastor, and being around the church scene, um, after being in that surrounding or in that atmosphere for a while, the calling on my life that I knew was there at 12 years old began to kind of sprout back up. And I was like, oh, here we go. The very thing that I was trying to suppress, the very thing I was trying to run from, the very thing that I did not want no part of. I mean, nobody chooses to do ministry, y'all. I need you to hear me. Nobody's like, hey, God, I'll be a pastor and deal with a bunch of crazy folks. You know what I'm saying? I tell people all the time, I don't get paid to do ministry. I get paid to deal with people. People crazy. I probably say that 15 times a week. Well, I look at my secretary. People call or whatever. I'll look at my sec- our secretary and be like, yo, people are crazy, you know? And so nobody chooses to do ministry. I mean, nobody's like, hey, this is what I'm going to do. It has to be a calling on your life, right? And as I was working through this and that, that, that calling on my life came back, I got to a point. I said, you know what, God? I'm willing to do whatever it takes to fulfill the calling of my life. All right, pick up a broom. Whoa, whoa, God. <laughs> no, I don't think you heard me. What I'm saying is um, I believe I can do youth ministry, and um, I believe that I can probably uh, teach to these kids and be relevant and maybe even see some souls saved. If not, at least I can feed them some pizza and give them some, a safe place to hang out. You know, I believe I can do that. And God's like, okay, pick up a vacuum. No, 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 God. And I say, you, you ain't hear what I'm saying. Like, what I'm trying to tell you is I can do ministry. I believe that you put something inside of me to affect the lives of others. Okay, go clean the toilet. <laughs> and as I continue to do that and I continue to wrestle with God and I continue to have this conversation, I quickly begin to realize that ministry is not about teaching in front of people. Ministry is not about looking after kids. Ministry is doing what God has called you to do in your life. Amen. Ministry happens when you're in your workplace. God wants to use you to be a change agent. God wants to use you to affect the atmosphere in your workplace, that when you walk into that place and it's negative and you don't like nobody there and you have Nancy over here and Karen over here and you got these folks just being, ugh, you don't want to look at them. You got them people, 
God is calling you to be the one to walk in there and shift the atmosphere. That when people look at you and say, oh, there's something different about her. Oh, why are you always happy even when our boss is crazy? Why you always got peace? Why you always got joy? Man, a loved one just passed away and you come in here with a smile. You're, what is going on? It's because ministry is within you. There's a purpose that is within you. And so I say all of that to say this, that David was willing to do the little thing, the errand that his father called him to do, even though he was already anointed king, even though he knows somewhere in my future, I'm going to be king. He was willing to take a step back, humble himself and say, Dad, if you want me to go run this errand, I'll go run this errand. So he goes, runs this errand. And so sometimes doing, sometimes doing uh, the thing that seems beneath you is the very thing that will release the blessing and the promotion to you. Sometimes doing the very thing that you don't want to do can be the very thing that leads to the blessing and the promotion that you're willing to see and you're wanting to see. My wife can tell you, we served as youth leaders under a youth pastor. Even though I knew there was ministry, even though I knew that one day I was going to step into that, that, that assignment, we continued to be youth leaders. We continued to love on kids. I continued to vacuum. This ain't no lie. Like when I tell you vacuum, like straight up, after service, I'd be vacuuming. We'd be cleaning. We would be reupholstering chairs. We'd be doing all of this stuff. And I ain't saying that to say, hey, look at me. I'm trying to get you to understand that when you're willing to do the little things, the things that don't seem like the thing that you should be doing, when you're willing to do those things, God will see your faithfulness in that season and will bring the blessing and the promotion that you've been longing for. So stay faithful in your season. Continue to do the little things because it's the little things that lead to the greater things. Believe me, how many of you can say, you know what? There was a time in my life I did something very minute. I thought it was kind of just nobody noticed. But the next thing I knew, man, God just blessed my socks off. Anybody, feel, anybody ever experienced God that way? Yeah. There was one time me and my wife were sitting in an altar service. We had just, someone had just come up that morning and said, man, I feel like God wants me to give you this. Slipped a $100 bill. Now, when you a newly married dude and you got a, a little baby, somebody slips you a $100 bill, you're like, my God, hey! Are y'all Pentecostal church? Okay, I'm, I'm just making sure we good in here. Okay, all right. Some of y'all are like, whoa, where'd that come from? Though I might be white on the outside, there's a little brother inside of me, you know what I'm saying? So, and so, they gave me that $100, and I went to my wife. I said, babe, you ain't going to believe this, man. So-and-so just gave us $100. We can go buy some groceries. You ever been in that place you're trying to decide if you're going to pay the electric bill or buy some groceries? I've been there quite a few times early on in our marriage. Like, Lord, we're going to pay a bill? We need lights? We need water? Or we need food? Which one are we going to? It's the cycle. Like, which one are we doing? So this month, no electricity. Next month, will be no water. Next month, you know what I'm saying. And so he gave me this $100. Like, babe, we can, hey, listen, we can go. We can go get some real food for lunch. Then we go to the grocery store, and we're going to be good, right? And so we're in this altar service at church, and I'm on the front row, man, over by the youth area. And this is after we'd already become youth pastors, and we're kinda, we had a kind of section like this. You, like we, me and my wife would sit there. Youth would be behind us. And we were sitting there, and, man, we were just, there was an altar service, and God was just moving in an incredible way. And I saw this young man that we knew, him and his wife, newly, uh, not even married, or either newly married, and I think had a baby on the way. I can't remember. No, 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 no. They weren't even married. And so we're sitting there, and I'm like, I feel that $100 bill in my pocket, man. We just worshiping. I'm like, yes, God, thank you for that $100 bill, God. I, now we can go eat some real food. My wife likes Mexican food. I could take her to get some real Mexican food, and we can just, man, thank you, God. And I opened my eyes, and I saw this young man standing right there. And I was like, All right, God. I looked over at my wife. I said, hey, babe, um, looks like ramen again tonight. Um, I'm going to have to go give that young man this $100. Now, again, I want you to understand it has nothing to do with us. I'm just trying to paint a picture for you. I walked over. To this day, this young man does not even know who put that money in his hand. He was weeping, crying, had his hands lifted. I took that $100, put it in his back pocket, walked away, went back and worshiped. A week later, 
we were paying um, a mortgage on a home because at that time you could buy a home and pay as much for mortgage as you could for rent because we had a great lender, great friend who got us into a decent house. Um, and so at that time, we were, you, know, you pay your escrow, taxes, all of that stuff, right? And so I did that. That very week, we had overpaid $1,000 on our escrow and got a check in the bank. Now, I don't think, am I saying that it's because I gave that $100? I don't know. But I do know this, that I was obedient to what I knew God was telling me. And in that same week, I got a $1,000 check in the bank or in, in the mail because I had overpaid on my escrow. The taxes had gone down and we were still paying on higher taxes. Because I was being faithful. Because I was still doing what God had called me to do. I was doing the little things. And someone blessed me, and because they blessed me, I was able to bless someone else. And because I was able to bless someone else, God blessed me. Y'all hear me? When y'all thought I thought a hundred dollars was something, y'all, a thousand bucks, I'm like, my God, we going on vacation somewhere. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was incredible. So again, it's the little thing. So anyways, so, so David, uh, so anyways, will you do the things that are beneath you? Will you do the things that, though they may not look pretty now, will lead to the great things in the future, right? So it's the little things, again, that lead to the greater things. I gave, and I thought it was very minute. Say, here, man, here's $100. He never even knew about it. I just went about my business. And God said, because of your faithfulness, now let me show you what I can do in your life. But what I found out that whenever I do things that God calls me to do and whenever I do things that I feel like um, don't always sit well with other people, what I found that is whenever God wants to use you and when God wants to use me and when God wants to use me and my family to do certain things, you're always going to have negative folks in your life. You're always going to have those folks that say, God told you to do what? Nah, he didn't tell you to do that. Bro, you newly married with a kid. You gonna give $100 away to this dude? Come on, man. You can use that. You can't even pay your electric bill. You're trying to figure out how you're going to pay groceries. That ain't what you're supposed to do, man. Keep that $100 and take care of your family. Well, God told me to start a church. Not me. He didn't tell me that. God, no, he did not tell me to start no church. But God told me to do this. God told me to start this ministry in my church. Man, God didn't tell you to start that ministry of church. That would never be successful. He don't want you to do that. Just keep doing what you're doing, man. Just keep, just keep plugging along, man. God, don't want you. God wants me to start this business. Man, God don't want you to start that business. You got a good job. You make good money. Why would he want you to step away from that to start your own business, not even knowing where money's going to come from? He don't want you to do that. You always going to have negative folks in your life. You always going to have them people that are always going to see the worst of every situation. So it goes on and says this in verse 26. It said, David asked the men standing near... Oh, I'm, let me go back up real quick. Yeah, so it says, verse 26, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine? So he walks in, he hears this Philistine just talking trash to his brothers. Just talking trash. Goliath's over there like, ha! You see me? I see you. You see me? Look, and listen, I need y'all to understand. Goliath was probably even taller than me now on this stage. He was a big dude. And David, who was the run of the family, not the big strong brothers, the run of the family is like, yo, y'all going to let him talk to y'all that way? Because David's like, come out here. Somebody try me. I'm going to kill you. 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 Matter of fact, send five at a time. I'm going to still kill all y'all. Everyone. Y'all trash. Y'all ain't nothing. And David walks in here like, yo, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Y'all letting him talk to y'all that way? Y'all letting him come in here and talk about you and your God the way he's talking about him? Y'all letting him get away with talking this trash to y'all? This is what y'all doing? He's like, no, no, you ain't going to talk about my God that way. And so it goes on, it says this. It says, who, uh, then he asked, what would be done to the man who kills the Philistine and removes the disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that we should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had done, what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's older brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger and, and, and at him and asked, why have you come down here? And whom do you have the, uh, who did you leave those sheep with in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down here only to watch this battle. His brother, very own brother, like, little boy, what you doing down here? Who's tending them little sheep that you're supposed to be tending to? Why you come down here to check on us? Man, get back out there and do what you're supposed to be doing. You ain't a nobody. You a nobody. You ain't nothing. Get on out of here. His own brother looking at him and saying, you a nobody. 
You ain't got no place out here. Leave. Right? So Eliad spoke negative death. That's what I was saying. You always want to have negative in your life. And if David would have listened to his brother, he would have never seen Goliath. If David would have listened to Eliab and said, you know what, man, you're right. I'm kind of little. I ain't, got no, I ain't got no business being in here. Let me, just, let me just go back to the house. Brothers, y'all good? Everybody good? Okay, let me just go tell dad y'all good. I ain't got no place to be here. I ain't got no reason to be in here. All right, I'm going to go. But he didn't. But if he would have, he would have missed his destiny. He would have missed the very thing God was trying to do in that season of his life. So too many times, hear me, too many times we allow the voice of our brothers to keep us from our destiny. I had people that I thought were my best friends in ministry. And me and my wife were like, hey, man, God's calling us to go and do this thing. You going to give up this to go do that? Nah, man, you're making a mistake. You don't need to do that. Don't nobody ever succeed trying to be like that. Don't nobody ever succeed trying to do that. Nah, don't do that. Family members like, oh, you doing ministry full time? Well, what about engineering? What about having a real job? Oh, God. <laughs> Listen, first time somebody told me that, I about put this size 11 and a half in their mouth and kicked it out the back of their head. I'd be like, if you only knew what we dealt with, but you going to get a real job? So you just, so you just going just gonna to do ministry. And you and your family, y'all going to be okay. You're going to be able to take care of your people. Y'all, y'all good? Oh, so you don't want to be an engineer no more. Oh, you don't want to make all this good money and do, oh, oh, I don't know about it. Own family, my own family. My own family. Yeah. Looking at me and saying, oh, that's, no, not my parents. I, don't get me wrong. <laughs> not my parents. They are supportive in everything that I do. But there were folks in my family that looked at me and said, ministry? Because how I grew up, ministry wasn't even like a real time, like a real full-time thing. I grew up Church of Christ. Not Church of Christ, not Church of Christ um, but like White Church of Christ. You know what I'm saying? Like white church of Christ. Like no music, sing a cappella, take communion every Sunday. Pastor has three points message and you out of there. Now the teaching is, is very biblical, but there wasn't no room for the Holy Spirit to move. It was just, this is what it was, right? So that's the kind of house I grew up in. And so, or the kind of church I grew up in. And so the only person that even really did full-time ministry was the pastor. And he lived in a parsonage that probably was about half broke down. And he just did ministry. That's what he did. But you didn't have worship leaders. You didn't have all these other staff people that was paid. So my family didn't understand full-time ministry. They was like, what? So I'm saying that to say again, sometimes it's your own people that will be negative in your life. And sometimes if you, not sometimes, all the time, if you allow yourself to listen to that, it will keep you from the destiny God has for you. I learned a long time ago, I would rather please God than please man. I would rather please God than my family. I would rather please God than anyone else who has an opinion about what I should be doing. So too many times, if we allow the voice of our brothers to keep us from our destiny. And as I was reading this, I was like, man, man, David had a place to go. He had a vision. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was doing. And I took a step back, and I want you to write this down. I want you to write this down. If you ain't writing nothing else down, I want you to write this down this morning. The right vision with the wrong people is irrelevant. The right vision with the wrong people is irrelevant. What, what does that mean? It means this. You may have an incredible vision for your life and for your family, for your business, for whatever it is that you do. You may have an incredible vision for that. But if you have the wrong people, a part of that vision, that vision will become irrelevant. You will not see that vision prosper. You will not see that vision come to fruition because you have the wrong people. Even though it might be the right vision, you have the wrong people. And because you have the wrong people, that vision becomes irrelevant. We went through a thing. We went through something a couple years ago with uh, a church. And during that time, there was an incredible vision for that church. We were growing. We went from having 75 people to 650 in a year and a half. Not, I was not the pastor. Don't, don't get that wrong. I was a part of it, but not, I was not the pastor. Incredible vision. People being saved every single week. Lives being changed. Atheists coming in. Catholics coming in. All these people coming in that never really experienced God in a way. Multicultural. You looked out there, man, and it looked like the kingdom of God. 
It was an incredible vision, but because the wrong people got attached to it, because the wrong people had say-so in it, that ministry is no longer even in existence. Within four years, 75 people to 650 to nobody. Within not, no, it was probably more like eight years. Just that quick. Now, eight years seems like a long time. No, no, no. It happens quick. Right vision, wrong people. Vision became irrelevant, and that ministry is no longer around. In your life, you may have an incredible vision for your life. You may have an incredible vision for your family. You may have an incredible vision for your, for your business, for whatever it is that you find yourself doing, whatever you find your hands to do. You may have an incredible vision for that. But if you allow the wrong people to connect to that thing, sis, I don't know why I keep looking at you. I don't know why. Can I just stop for a minute? I don't know why I keep looking at you, but for some reason, man, God has stopped this moment for you. And I don't know what it is that you're going through, what decisions you're about to have to make, what it is that's going on. But I believe that God in this moment is about to bring such clarity to you. He's about to begin to show you things that you've been praying for, things that you've been hurting. You're like, God, I just can't do this no more. I don't know what God is about to begin to reveal things to you. And it's about to become so clear in your life. God, right now, Father, I pray that you will do what only you can do. Father, begin to make that thing so clear, whether it's a decision, whether, God, I don't know what it is, but God, I know you stopped this moment just for her. So Father, whatever it is, do it today. God, give her peace in that situation. Give her peace now, God. Now, God. Give her peace now, God. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in her life right now. I thank you, God, though, though she may come in here and just take some pictures, God, there is such a greater purpose for her. There is such a greater design for her. So, Father, I thank you today for what you're doing in her life. God, let it be easy. Oh, yeah, there it is. There it is. Let it be easy. No second guessing. Oh, mm. thank you, God. Thank you, God. Do it today in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Mm. Thank you, God. Mm. I'm sorry, y'all. I feel like that there's blinders that have been on you. I feel, yeah, you know, like when you see horses downtown Savannah and they're just trotting, and the reason they're able to trot the way they trot is because there's blinders and they just stay focused on what's coming ahead. I believe you've been so focused on that one thing, so focused on that one situation, that one problem, but I'm believing God is about to take the blinders off and you're going to begin to see a whole new perspective of whatever it is. I, again, I don't know. God has not shown me what it is, but I know God stopped this very moment to say the blinders are coming off and there's going to be a whole new perspective. Perspective. Sometimes we get so forward, forward focused that all we can see is the problem. All we can see is the issue. All we, not knowing that there's a whole nother world, there's a whole nother thing out here. God has taken the blinders off. And God is going to show you something so incredible, so great. So I'm again, I'm just praying joy. I'm praying peace. I'm praying that it's easy. I'm praying that even today, God, that is beginning to work. It's beginning to work. I'm believing even after you leave this place, by even this evening, that you're already going to begin to see a shift and a change in whatever that is in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Mm, amen, amen, amen. So the right vision with the wrong people is irrelevant, right? So it goes like this. It says in verse 29, y'all hang with me. What time is it? 12, 12? All right. What time y'all usually get done? Oh, hallelujah. Is there, y'all, anybody bring some lunch? I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so in verse 29, it says, now what have I done? Said David, Can I, can't I even speak? He turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant, the king. Hold on. The king, David, anointed king, goes to the king, y'all going to get it in a minute. The position that he's about to take, the place that he's going, the one that can say, I'm king. No, no, no. He goes and humbles himself to the position that he's about to take. Staying faithful and obedient in his seizing, showing honor to the king. So he goes to the king. 
That's a little side note. Y'all going to get it in a minute. Y'all going to be driving home and be like, oh, y'all can get it. Y'all just stick with me. So what David said was overheard. He said, uh, you're not only <laughs> on the count of the Philistine, he said, king. He said, what David said was overheard. Let no one lose heart. You're not able. So uh, he said, you're not able to go against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear come and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised fillet, and at this point I can kind of see David's chest, be like, I'm telling you, I've killed a bear, I've killed a lion, so this little uncircumcised Philistine right here ain't got nothing on me. And you know, you know, when you start feeling the anointing of the Holy Spirit and you start walking in that thing, all of a sudden you go from just walking to your chest, kind of getting up. You're like, oh, I got something for you, devil. Right. And so he just goes, he says, your servant has killed both the bear and the lion. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Again, showing honor to his God. He said, the Lord has rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So Saul began to dress David in his own tunic. He put on a coat of armor and on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened a sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. And he looked at Saul and said, yo, I can't wear this because, again, I need you to understand, it wasn't his big old seven uh, brothers that were big and burly. It was just small, little, handsome David. And so you know that Saul's armor was probably a big dude. Saul was a big dude. So the armor was big. He put the helmet on probably right over around a little bit. I've got a two-year-old, and uh, he loves playing baseball. Now, when I tell you, this kid, since he's been walking, he's a lefty. My dad's a lefty. It has to be the only place it came from. I have no idea because the rest of us are right-handed. Since he's been walking, has known what a baseball was, a bat, any kind of ball, he knows what it is. He has been, he throws left-handed. I can't even do the motion without looking crazy because I'm right-handed. He can throw left-handed. He takes the bat and swings left-handed. He puts the ball up on the tee and hits it. We'll go out in the yard he, all by himself. Two years old now, he is smacking the ball. Puts the glove on, fills it. Throw, two, not five, two. But what he loves, what I love, I love to watch him get that tee, put the ball, and he goes and gets his 13-year-old brother's helmet. And he puts it on. And he'll go run, and that thing's like, phew, phew. you know what I'm saying? You've seen little kids with helmets, right? And I have a, it, when I, whenever I read this, that's kind of what I pictured. I kind of pictured David with this helmet, and it's just kind of rattling around on his head. He's got this armor that's supposed to be a chest plate, but it probably goes to his knees. He has a sword that he's supposed to put around his waist, but when he does, it kind of stands up here. You know what I'm saying? So this, this armor and stuff that he put on is not him. He ain't used to that. He ain't killed no bear with that. He hadn't killed a lion with that. And so as I was reading, I was like, you know what, man, that's so incredible. You know why it's incredible? Because David realized he couldn't be someone he wasn't. He had to be who he was. He couldn't use this armor and this sword because he ain't never used that. That ain't him. But he knew that if he had a sling and some stones, he could sure use that. I remember years ago. Um, whenever Stephen Furtick and T.D. Jakes and all of them, they were doing conferences together. And I remember um, whenever I was coming up trying to preach, you know, when you're preaching, you have things that make you you, but there's also little things you try to pull from other people because at that time they're relevant, and at that time you want to sound like them and be like them and try to preach like them because you feel like that's going to be the thing that pulls people's attention. You kind of forget about your own anointing and your own calling, and you try to pull on something that ain't you, right? And so I remember one time... Uh, I was listening. He, uh, T.D. Jakes was having a conference, and I was in the gym working out, and I had these headphones on listening to the conference, and T.D. Jakes made a statement that has forever shaped my life forever in ministry. He said, God can't bless what he doesn't recognize. Whoa. God can't bless what he doesn't recognize. What does that mean? God can't bless me trying to be T.D. Jakes. God can't bless me trying to be Stephen Furtick. God can't bless me trying to be Pastor Brandon. God can't bless me. But the moment I step out and say, God, here I am, Matt Ron, the one that you've called, the one you've equipped, the one that you have a purpose for. God, here I am. God can bless that. In the same way, David, 
God, David knew I can't be I can't be productive. I can't accomplish what I need to accomplish trying to be this soldier when I know that in reality, God has called me to be a shepherd. And because I'm a shepherd, now I have a sling and I have some stones. And not only did he have a sling and stones, he had three stones. Let me tell you why. God not only equipped him for what he needed, but he equipped him in case there was craziness in the future. He had three stones, one for Goliath. But guess how many brothers Goliath had? Two. So he was like, you know what? I'm going to kill Goliath, but if the two brothers come after me, I got two more stones ready to go. Do you think he was just picking up those stones just to pick up? No, God. It was a purpose. On Thank you, sis. Come on. Won't you come up here and preach for me? There was a purpose. He knew I can't use a stone. I can't use a shield. I can't use a breastplate. I can't use a helmet. I cannot use a sword. But what I can use is what I've got, what I've been equipped with, what God has called me to do. And I'm looking at you this morning to tell you this, that God is looking at you and say, I have not called you to be anything else but who you are. I've equipped you. I've anointed you. I've called you. So whatever he has given you, it is your turn. He has called you to be anointed. He has called you to have purpose. He has called you to do things for his kingdom that only you can do. Just like my sis right here, missionary. I can't do that. For one, I ain't got patience for that. For two, I don't want to raise my own money. Hello, somebody. But her and her husband and their family, they are missionaries. They are equipped for that. God has called them for that. And I believe there is such an incredible blessing about to come on that ministry that they're going to look back and say, only God. But I can't do that. But what I can do is I can get up here and I can preach and I can encourage you and I can just tell you that God loves you and there's a calling on your life. There's a purpose on your life. And though you may see yourself in a negative situation, though you may not be where you want to be, though you may not be going where you think you're supposed to be going, sit back, baby, and just be obedient in this season. Because I believe that if you continue to be obedient, you continue to do what God has called you to do. I believe that there is promotion and blessing coming your way that when you look back, you say, man, I'm glad I was faithful in this season. Because now here I am in this new season, loving God, happy, blessed. Amen, somebody? Come on, amen, somebody? I ain't even done. I was just, that's, that's, y'all ready for part two? I'm just kidding. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. So, <laughs> whoo, can you hand me that real quick? Whew, I'm kind of fighting a cold, so y'all just kind of bear with me. Man. So, so he was dressed in all of this stuff, right? Took the stuff in his hand. He chose, uh, chose the stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of, his step, uh, of the shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the, and this is verse 41, meanwhile, the Philistine, with the shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more, he was no, he was little more than a boy, glowing with health, health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, I am a dog that you come at me with a stick. Because again, he's a shepherd. He's got his pouch with stones, got his sling, and he's got his stick, right? And he says, I'm a dog that you come to me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give you the I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. I mean, Goliath is just talking trash to David. Like, you come on over here. I'm about to wear you out, son. I'm about to take you to the back of the woodshed. I'm going to show you what it's all about. I don't know. If you didn't grow up in South Georgia, you probably ain't heard that word. But when you tell somebody you're going to take them to the woodshed, that means you're about to wear them out, right? And so he said, listen, I'm going to wear you out. Come on over here. I'm going to kill you, stomp you, and leave your carcass there for the birds to eat. Just bring it on, brother. That's what he's saying, right? And so David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. He turned it around on him. He said, you threatened to kill me and put me down there for the birds? I'm telling you what's about to happen. I'm going to come and kill you, and when I kill you, the birds are going to be eating on your flesh. And he said, and the whole world would know that there is a God in Israel. Once again, this Goliath is here talking trash, and David has come in the name of the God, uh, name of God, and he said, let me tell you something. I'm about to kill you. I'm going to cut off your head, and at the end of the day, I'm doing all of this for the glory of God. 
All of those gathered here will know that this is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistines moved closer to attack, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag, taking out the stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran, stood over him, took the, and took hold of the Philistine's sword, drew it from his sheath, and after he killed him, he cut off his head. And he, and he uh, cut off his head with his sword. He looked at him and said, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I come to you in the name of the God. And so because of that, I'm telling you this day that not only am I going to kill you, but I'm going to cut off your head with your own sword. That is gangster, brother. And as he did, he killed him, struck him down, took the, 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 the sword out of his sheath. Again, you know this had to be a big old sword. He probably had two hands on that thing, pulling it out, lifted it up. Head rolled a little bit. If y'all see movies, you know what I'm talking about. Head rolled a little bit. Probably picked it up, kind of like 300, black. Like, ah, you know what I say. And said, I'll tell you this day that everything I do is for the Lord. David can look back over his life and say it was this moment. This was the moment that everything changed. He can look back over, this, over his life and say he was able to kill that Philistine. He was able to step into his destiny, and he was able to accomplish all that God had for him because why? He was faithful in his seasons before. He killed a lion and a bear. Why? Because he was a shepherd in the field, not being chosen, doing what his father asked him to do, only becoming stronger, only learning how to kill the big things in life. If it had not been for that season, he'd have never stepped into this season. If it had not been for that season, he'd have never been able to kill uh, Goliath. He was preparing, like Michael, like Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan prepared. He dribbled, he ran, he shot, because he knew there was a time coming. In the same way, David prepared. He fought, he gathered, he shepherded. You know, as a king, he had to shepherd a lot of people. He shepherded, he tended the sheep, he killed the lion, he killed the bear, he went after the one when it would get away, hello somebody, he would go after the other one whenever it would get away. He did everything in the season, and when I look back, God was preparing him in that season. That was the season, doing that as a shepherd, tending his father's flock, that was the season God was using him, equipping him, making him what he wanted to be, to when it came to that moment on the battlefield, he knew that it was his turn. And this morning, I look at a group of people in here, and I want you to know that it's your turn. You've been obedient. You've been faithful. You've been doing what God has asked you to do. You've been doing what God has called you to do. You've been doing those little things that may seem kind of beneath you. But I want you to understand this when it comes to David. God will use your faithfulness on an ordinary day in an extraordinary way. David was just being faithful. He went out there to just go check on his brothers. He went out there just to go be obedient to his father and say, let me go see if my brothers are okay. And because of his faithfulness to his father on that day, he showed up and God turned his faithfulness on that ordinary day and used it in an extraordinary way. And I'm believing this morning, I'm looking at a group of people that God has been using you. I'm looking at a group of people that have been serving, that have been doing, that have been living this life. Again, sometimes doing things that seem beneath you. Not that it necessarily seems beneath you, but when you take a step back, you're like, man, that, that doesn't really seem that important. That doesn't really seem like I'm having much effect in what I'm doing right here. But God, I'm going to keep being faithful because apparently you've got me here for a reason. And I'm looking at a group of people that I believe that God is ready to use your faithfulness on an ordinary day in an extraordinary way. I want you to understand this morning, just like David, that prepared his whole life for that moment, that God has been preparing you. You've been preparing. You've been faithful. You have been obedient. And God is ready to use you because guess what? It's your turn. Can I tell you something? It's y'all's turn. It's your turn. Ma'am, it's your turn. Ladies, it's your turn. 
It's your turn. Now, I don't know what your turn looks like. I don't know what it is that God is saying, hey, here it is. Step into it. Here it is. Do it. Here it is. Be faithful. Here it is. Be obedient. Here it is. Just do what I'm asking you to do. Here it is. I don't know what that is in your life, but I'm telling you this morning that it's your turn. I'm telling you this morning that I believe that there is something in this house that you can be doing that you're not doing. I believe there's something in this house that you could be serving that you're not serving. I believe there's area in this, in this ministry that God could be using you for a greater purpose. He's just waiting on you to say, you know what, God? Here I am. I believe this morning that I'm looking at a group of people that it's your turn. I'm believing that your faithfulness on this ordinary day. Now, am I saying today's the ordinary day? No, no, no. But there will come a moment that your faithfulness on an ordinary day that God will look at and say, I can use that in an extraordinary way. This morning, I want you to be open. I want you to be receptive. And I want you to be obedient. I can't get that out of my heart. Just be obedient to what God wants to do in your life. Because I'm telling you, man, when you are obedient to God, God is so faithful. Me and my wife were obedient in a season for three and a half years that we were miserable. Hear me. Serving full-time ministry, miserable. Contemplated giving up ministry altogether. It got to a point one night I looked at her and said, I will move back home. I will get a regular job. I'll work three jobs if I have to. But I'm not going to live in this craziness, this chaos, and this hell anymore. And she looked at me and she said, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. And it was in that moment. And she'll tell you, man, God checked me. Oh, man, he checked me. And I looked at her. I said, but do you believe there's another season coming? She said, oh, yeah. I looked at her. I said, do you believe that this is what we're supposed to be doing? Absolutely. Do you believe that this is the calling and purpose in our life? No doubt. I looked at her and I said, we have to be faithful in this season. Were we miserable? Absolutely. Were we faithful? Whew, God, I hope so. As much as we could be. <laughs> and now, coming out of those three and a half years, we went to Vegas on a, she, she, uh, she's a makeup artist on the side, something fun that she gets to do. It's a hobby of hers, on top of being a boutique owner. And we went to Vegas because they were having a conference there. And she was a top person during that year, you know, doing really well for herself. And so we went out to Vegas, never been. We were like, this would be a full, you know, cool just to go out there, me and her. And we went out there, and we were on the flight there. And I looked at her, and I said, I could get used to this. The freedom just to kind of go and do, you know. And we got to Vegas, and she did her conference thing. And then we'd go out to dinner, go explore Vegas. I would be okay if I never went back. But it was an experience and experience and one of the last days we were sitting and uh, I looked at her and I said when we get back we're going to start looking for something else we had already talked to the, uh, the general or the uh, state overseer for the church of God in South Georgia and we told him we were ready just call us and we're ready at that time we were hey we'll go be lead pastor somewhere we'll do whatever you want us to do just get us out of here right we'd already had that conversation with him he said um, there's nothing open right now. He said, but if something comes open, I'll let you know. And so it had been a couple months. We hadn't heard anything. So while we were in Vegas, I looked at her, and I said, I said, babe, I said, when we get back home, if nothing happens, I'm going to get on the Internet, whether it's in our denomination or not, and we're going to find something, we're going to go, because I felt the release. We were in Vegas, and we felt that release to like, hey, it's time. It's weird that it was in Vegas that God spoke, but hey, that's a different story. And I looked at her and I said, I said, when we get back, we're going we're gonna to look for whatever the next thing, whatever that next thing is. I said, because I believe we've been faithful in this season and I believe God's released us and I believe that there's something coming. On the flight back home from Vegas, we land in Savannah. I take my phone, turn it off at airplane mode and I have a text from Pastor Aaron Coward. I said, hey man, you know someone that does children's church? I said, man, I don't, I'm sorry. And my wife looked at me and said, if it'll get us out of here, I'll do children's church. Straight, like, <laughs> she's laughing like that because, like, straight up, we were on the plane, and it was just that quick. She's like, if it, I'll do children's church. Now, my wife likes kids, but she don't love them. 
She loves, she loves our kids, you know what I'm saying? But hear me. And she said, she said if, it, if, it'll, if it'll get us out of where we at now, I'll go be a kids pastor. I'll go be a kids director. So I texted him. I said, how about this? Bring me on as your associate pastor. Let my wife do kids, and we'll move next week. Nothing. He said, ha-ha, that'd be cool. Nothing. 30 minutes later, are you serious? Uh, I looked at her. I said, are we serious? <laughs> she said, I don't care. If this is what God's doing, this is what God's doing. Within a month, God had connected every dot, done everything that needed to be done, had prepared the way already. There was already a house that was for rent that they wanted us to come and move into. And within a month, we went from being in one of the most miserable times in our life to one of the most joyous seasons in the last two and a half years at Live Oak Church with Pastor Christy and Aaron Coward. And I believe, hear me, I believe it's because we were faithful and obedient even when we weren't happy, even when it didn't look like we thought it was supposed to look like. And I say that to you to tell you this this morning. You may be in a season of your life that you're miserable. You may be in a season of your life you don't know what God's trying to tell you or what God's trying to do in you. You may be in a season of your life you're just confused and like, God, what's next? What am I doing? Whatever season you're in, be faithful. Be obedient. And allow God to use your ordinary a faithfulness on, your, on an ordinary day for an extraordinary day or an extraordinary way. Because again, I do believe this, that it's your turn. How many of you this morning say, I need it to be my turn? Come on, how many of you this morning can say, I need it to be my turn? I've seen a whole lot of people have their turns. God, I need it to be my turn. Come on, will you stand with me this morning? I didn't plan to go that long, but man, I just, I just, felt, I just felt like God was trying to say something this morning. Whew. One more time, if you need it to be your turn, because I'm about to pray for you. If you need it to be your turn, get God, it's my turn. If that's you this morning, just lift your hands. Now, can you take that other hand and just slide it up in a sign of surrender? Father, you see the hands of your people this morning. God, they heard your word. They heard the story of David and his faithfulness and his obedience in a season that where really he could have been doing something far greater. He remained faithful and obedient, tending the flock, tending the business of his father until that moment that you turned his faithfulness on an ordinary day and used it in an extraordinary way. Father, you see the hands of your people. And God, they've been faithful. They've been obedient. And so, Father, this morning, God, I, will t- I pray that you take their faithfulness and use it in an extraordinary way. God, that it's their turn. Though it's t- is today that day? I don't know. Maybe it is. Is tomorrow? I don't know, but maybe it is. But, Father, I pray that you give them the strength to stay faithful, to stay confident, to stay strong. God, to stay obedient in it, what it is that you are, have them doing in this season. Because, Father, a new season is coming. A new season is coming for them. God, it's their turn. So, Father, I pray that you equip them. God, give them everything they need in this season that when they step into the next season, they have no, ch- they have no choice but to succeed. They have no choice but to flourish. They have no choice but to be blessed. They have no choice but to see your favor. So, Father, today, bless them. Equip them. Use them. Do what only you can do in their life this morning. And Father, we're believing today that it's their turn. Father, we thank you for what you've done in this house. God, again, I thank you for the opportunity to bring your word. I thank you, Father, the honor to be able to stand in this pulpit and bring your word. Father, today I pray that you you do what only you can do in the hearts and minds and the lives of these people. It's their turn. It's their turn. Can you just say that? Say, it's my turn. Come on, say it like you mean it. It's my turn. Oh, God, they said it today. It's their turn. So, Father, use them for your glory. And it's in your son, Jesus, we pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. Come on, can you give God a hand this morning?